Not much time to talk, so let's just skip the intro and get into this. So I just got my first large wholesale order and in the middle of making the products for the client, I thought to myself, I should definitely make a video out of this because I'm learning so much about the process from the initial conversation with the client, the design, to the production, and now to actually finishing it out to deliver it to them. And I felt like there's so much information here that I can share with you guys. So one, if you guys are going to do this for a client, you're not going to make the same mistakes. And also, did you hear that thunder? Oh, that was crazy. Man, it's just like raining out there. Not only share the mistakes that I've made, but also shared some of the efficiencies that I've picked up along the way to make this entire process more streamlined, quicker, easier, and pretty much hassle-free. Well, uh, there goes my power. <laughs> The rain is pouring out there, it's thundering, it's lightning, and I have officially lost power. <laughs> oh man, great. And just when I said that, the power comes back on. All right, first part of this entire process I wanted to talk about is the design process. Pretty much how it worked was the client came up to me, they had a product that they wanted to make. They had a general idea of what the product would look like, they had pictures and everything like that. So this is pretty much what what it is that they wanted. This and then some other um, stuff that I'll show you guys later on, but so far this is what I've been doing, just this product here. So the client and I went through a, a few design iterations of this. Um, as you can see here, this is a very simple shape. All it is is a rectangle prism with a curve at the very top here, and that is pretty much it for the design. I don't have the prototypes with me anymore, but we went through about six different prototypes a few 3D modeling, and we ended up with this final product here. So the design phase from the initial concept to this final product here took about three weeks to get to. The first thing that I wanted to bring up is you gotta charge for your time in the design phase. And I've learned the hard way from this because I've lost a lot of money and a lot of time um, doing design for people and not getting paid for it. Just because I was so excited to even have the opportunity to do this job or to, to work on this project. So it's important that you, one, value your time. For this project, I charged a flat design fee as well as a sample fee for every single item that I was going to send her. Now, as I mentioned before, for this particular job, I designed about six different iterations of this um, product here, which also meant six different samples to be sent to the clients for their approval. So that's material cost, that's time involved running the CNC, then there's shipping costs, then there's packaging costs, and on top of that there were different stains that the client wanted to see as well. So I made different stain samples, all of that. So I definitely had to make sure that I was charging enough for those three weeks in the event that the client you know, doesn't go through with the project. Um, I wouldn't be lost out of a lot of money or time. Another big part of the entire conversation is really just to be open and to communicate really well with the client. You want to make sure you set the expectation in terms of quality, in terms of finishes, in terms of the design. That way the client know exactly what the product is going to look like. And I did have a few little mistakes that I wanted to share with you, and that's with this specific product right here. The sample that I sent to the client was a six by six square sample, and I also designed it in a six by six as well on the computer. What I should have done was design the pattern for the larger board and then take smaller cuts from the large board for their smaller boards. That way there's no scaling issues with the pattern. That's what went wrong here. The smaller sample, these patterns were way smaller. And when I went to scale it up to this size here, of course the pattern was going to be a little bit larger. On my part, I didn't communicate that with the client. I assumed, again, you shouldn't assume anything that the client was going to be okay with it, that the design was pretty much exactly what they wanted. But in reality, they expected the pattern to look exactly like the sample throughout the entire board, no matter what side it was. On my part, that was a communication error. I should have been more specific as to what the final product or final scale of the pattern would look like. Once the client has approved of the design, I made sure to get it in writing, whether it be in a form of an email, whether it be a signed contract, to make sure that 
this is the final design. No more changes are going to happen. And if there are any changes, I would have to charge additional for that. You don't want to be in a situation where the client constantly changes the design and you're having to make those changes and then you're not going to get paid for it. So make sure in writing, get an approval. Once the client gives me the approval, I'll go ahead and send the invoice over to them. I take a 50% deposit. That way it covers pretty much all the materials that I need to purchase. And speaking about materials, the next part I wanted to talk about is sourcing your materials. When sourcing your material, try to establish a business account from whatever lumber yard you're buying your lumber from. Sometimes if you do have a business account established with the lumber yard, you might get a little bit of a discount compared to somebody who would just walk in there a basically a retail client or retail customer. And in some cases, the lumber yard might keep track of all of the materials you purchase. So at the end of the year, you can ask for a record of all the material you purchase, and then that will help you with your taxes at the end of the year. When I'm picking out the material for a large project like this, even if it's a furniture build. And this goes back to establishing the expectations for your client. Although I do let the client know within the contract and the invoice that tone and grain patterns is out of my control. If the lumber yard has more sapwood and is a little bit lighter, or if there's more hardwood and is a little bit darker, that's something that I can't control. And I wanna make sure that the client knows that inside of the contract. But I still go through the process of trying to pick the best material as I can so that it matches the sample as much as possible. Another tip when you're purchasing a lot of lumber for something like this, when you're batching out products is ask the lumber yard if they offer any discounts based off of a certain quantity of board foot that you're buying. At my lumber yard, there's a minimum of 200 board feet before any discounts uh, can be applied. With that discount, there is a small little caveat where um, they would choose the material for me and it's usually random width or random length, meaning that I can't really control how wide the boards are or how long the boards are. It's solely up to them to pick it out. So I could get very small boards like this or um, very thick boards like the bottom down here. In this case, 200 board feet is actually a lot. I don't need that much. So I went ahead and just picked out the materials myself. The last thing I'll say about sourcing your material is try not to go to the big box store to purchase your hardwood lumber. Um, they usually mark it up a lot. The best way to save some money on the material is to go to the lumber yard. It's typically cheaper. And if you could buy rough lumber, if you have like a jointer, a planer, uh, a table saw, any way to mill up rough lumber, that's going to be the cheapest solution. And those savings translate into either more product, more chances of the client purchasing from you instead of somebody else, or it could also mean additional profits for your business. So that's all I wanted to say about the business aspect. That could be a total video in and of itself. And also pricing. If you want me to make a video going over pricing, uh, leave a comment down below. And if there is enough interest, then I'll go ahead and make that video too. So now that I have the material, let's go ahead and mill it up. The most efficient way that I figured out how to batch out the product is to cut these boards in their rough state. The bed of my CNC is 48 inches long by 24 inches wide. But the thing is, if I cut it at the full length of the 48, I'm going to have a lot of waste because the product itself is 6.5 inches. So based off of my calculations, if I cut the stock into 40 inch long blanks, I can get six final pieces out of that 40 inch blank. So that's what I'm going to do with the stock here. I'm going to cut them at 40 inches and then I'll run them through the joint turn the planer to get them down to the thickness that I need, which is an inch and three quarters. I got all of the parts milled out and they're pretty much the exact thickness that I need for the actual uh, final piece. And on my CNC here, I've set up some rails for me to uh, push my workpiece up against. And that's part of the efficiency when you're using the CNC. You wanna make sure that you're, if you're making multiple parts that are the same, 
make sure you're, that your machine is starting at the origin point every single time you come to place in a new piece of stock. That's gonna be very beneficial when you're trying to batch out a lot of the same parts because simply I just take my stock here, place it against my rails. My machine has already been uh, zeroed out. Clamp in my toggles. And all I have to do is tell the machine to go to the origin and start the cut from there. Once the cut's done, I simply take out this stock, put in a new one, literally just hit go and it'll pretty much do the exact same thing. It's a process that repeats itself if you set everything up correctly. Because the last thing you want to do is place in your stock, redo your X, Y, Z points, and constantly going back and forth trying to reset all that, reprobe it. Even if it's just like plywood like mine right here, do that, that way you have an original point that you can always reference off of. And there are other ways to set up the CNC bed, uh, which eventually in a future video, I'm going to show you exactly how I'm going to upgrade this to make sure that it's production ready for something like this in the future. Enough with the talking, let's get into the CNC action. Once the blanks were milled on the CNC, I took it to the table saw, cut off all the excess. And this is what it looks like after that. All right, so here are the blanks. The curve has been made on the CNC and I trimmed out all the excess on the table saw there. For this one here, I found that if I made the blanks like this, I was a little more efficient in terms of my material as well as how quickly I can batch it out. So. I would run one side first, flip it 180, then get the other side um, to mill up. And then I would trim the excess off on the table saw. And sometimes depending on the stock that I have, I'm able to get a centerpiece that is wide enough for me to mill up another, um, another blank there. Let me uh, just set you guys down right here really quick. You might be asking why don't I just cut this to the right length since I'm already at the table saw. The reason why is Sanding this entire piece down is much easier than if I were to sand these individual blocks here because there are some mill marks from the table saw on the side here. I want to make sure that everything is nice and smooth before we go to stain. And holding on to this while I'm using the sander is a little bit more difficult to hold on to. And also I'll have to hand sand this um, curve right here. So. Doing it this way allows me to get all the sanding done as quick as possible. Another thing is if I cut all the pieces down to these individual blocks, it just makes it a little bit more harder to, to organize um, which parts have been sanded and which part hasn't because I have to go through two steps of sanding, one with 120 and then one with 180. So I can make sure that I'm not inadvertently sending the client a piece that has not been sanded because one, I don't want them to deal with any returns because it's not perfect. And also it just doesn't really look good if I send a product that's not perfect though. So let's go on to the next step, which is to have all these parts sanded down. Once everything is sanded, I'll cross cut the blanks on the table saw to the right lengths. And if there is any sanding needed, it'll be only on the ends. As you can see here, there is a little bit of some burrs that I need to just hand sand down to knock out. Uh, but other than that, the ends feel really nice. I'm using a high tooth uh, table saw blade, so there's not much sanding needed. When I was developing the toolpath for this product here, I thought about just using the CNC to create the final product, um, cutting it down to the right length. And upon thinking about that, I felt like it was going to generate too much waste, especially with a quarter inch end mill, and also the time of changing the bits back and forth. I would have had to calibrate the Z and that could potentially add some error into the final product. So for the sake of consistency, as well as, um, not producing so much waste. This is the approach that I took, which is to cut the final length over on the table saw instead of having everything done on the CNC. If I did have a CNC that had a uh, auto tool changer, then possibly I would have done everything on the CNC. But for now, I think this approach is gonna work the best.
All right, so I have all the blocks here sanded down and everything is nice and smooth. For this project here, the client actually wants me to brand her logo onto the actual piece. In the past, I've used a torch with a branding iron to brand all of my products. And that's a good basic way of doing it. It's relatively inexpensive to get a brass branding iron, uh, one that you could use with a torch. The only issue there is the consistency of the burn. You have to make sure your iron is going to be at a consistent temperature. Since that's not gonna give me the result that I'm looking for, I thought about actually getting a laser to actually do the laser engraving. But with the laser, it's gonna take a little bit longer because the laser, what it does is it continually goes back and forth, burning little by little at a time. With the laser, it's gonna be more consistent, but time-wise, it's going to add a lot of time to production. So this is what I'm using to actually brand the logo onto the workpiece. This is pretty much a branding iron. Um, that is connected to my drill press. What I have here is just a small jig so that I can line up my parts uh, exactly where it needs to be every single time. So what I can do is just set the part where it needs to be, push down on my drill press, hold it for a couple of seconds, and it's gonna be perfect. And I wanna show you exactly how all this is possible because there's one component that allows the iron to be heated up at a consistent temperature, and that is this thing right here. So this is where the magic happens for me to get the iron heated up at a consistent temperature and for it to maintain that temperature throughout the entire burn. And by having this control box, I'm able to have a consistent burn for all of the products. This thing is pretty cool. I can set the temperature from pretty much one all the way to I think like 900 or something, a little bit higher. The manufacturer recommends nothing over 850 for wood. I set it on 600 because that is the type of burn that the client likes. It is a little bit lighter, but she doesn't want her logo to stand out too much. She wanted it to be very subtle. So 600 is where we're gonna set it at. So let's go ahead and get all of the logos burned in. Yeah, it is, um, it's really hot. Yeah. <laughs> I am sweating like, crazy right now. All right, so all the pieces have been sanded down to 180 grit uh, out in the shop there. I moved it all into the house here so I can go ahead and do the final step, which is to stain and finish the product. Out in the shop, it's really dusty, so I wanna make sure that I'm in a controlled environment, but also it's very comfortable in here. I'm in AC on the shop, it's freaking hot, so I don't have to sweat all over the product, uh, which is a benefit. So the way the order is broken down is 50 of these will be stained with the ebony stain that I have right here. 50 of these will be uh, unfinished. Um, I already have that shipped out. And then I have another 50 that will be to be decided um, based off of what she wants. And then the white oak versions of these will get a Danish oil finish, which I have, have some right here. These are just basically Danish oil finished. That's what we're gonna do right now. We're gonna go ahead and finish it all. Hopefully by the end of the day, it will dry and we can go ahead and start packaging everything to get it shipped out. All right guys, so I got everything in place here. All of my parts have been stained and I'm slowly just packaging it into place here. So this brings me to the final step of the entire process, and that is shipping. You spend all this time working on your product, and then what would really suck is you ship it, and in the middle of the way it gets lost, it gets damaged, and all that comes out of your profit. Trying to make sure that you package things in a secure way is very important. Since we're on the topic of shipping, there are a few things that I wanted to just touch upon. That is trying to find the best rate for your shipping prices. I use a few different shipping services, third-party services. I'll leave a link in the description down below to those services if you guys are interested because for me and my area, those services have given me the best rates. 
Uh, one is ShipNerd and the other is Pirate Ship. So they're a third party shipping company. I mean, I'm not exactly sure how it works, but they're able to negotiate really good rates for shipping. And so I've been using them for a few years now, going back and forth between the two. Pirate Ship is mainly for USPS and then ShipNerd is mainly for UPS. So it just really depends on which price is the best for the product that I'm shipping and where it's going. From my experience, ShipNerd is going to give me better pricing on larger products and Pirate Ship's going to give me better pricing on smaller products. That's how I typically use it. So if you guys are interested, use the link down below. Those links are not affiliate, so I don't benefit anything from it. You guys want to use it, go ahead and use it. I just want to give you guys the information to hopefully help you guys out in your business, hopefully to lower the cost of shipping because as we all know, everybody wants free shipping now and the lower the rate we can get shipping, it's more profits in our pockets. All right, so it's been about three weeks so far and pretty much all of the product that you saw me make, the twig bases, it's pretty much done. And we got some inside the house, but I wanted to show you sort of the progress that's going on right now inside the shop with the uh, remaining products here. So this is pretty much all, or at least part of um, the first half of this order here. These are all of the trays with the patterning on there, as you guys can see there. All in all, it has taken about about a month total of work, maybe a little bit less than that. This entire process is about just being as efficient as possible, trying to set things up in stations and getting things done in bulk. That definitely helps with a lot of the timing. For example, this product right here, all the milling was done first to get the stock down to the right size. Then I placed it on the CNC, bash out as much as possible on the CNC for one day. The next day I came back, continue batching things out on the CNC. And at the same time, I milled the product itself to the final size on my table saw. So while the CNC is running, I'm still doing work. And right now what I'm going to do is I'm gonna sand these things down, start to do the milling process on the CNC because I do have some stock here that I can place on the CNC. So having the CNC has made a lot of this possible. So if you're on the fence about getting CNC, I think right now is a great time to do that. It's relatively affordable. If you do want to get something more of a prosumer level, then highly recommend the Axiom. Link down below, you wanna pick one up. It is an affiliate link. So I do get a little bit of a kickback if you purchase through the link. So so I do appreciate that. If you want to do this long term, really consider it. It definitely changes up the workflow and it allows you to do so much different things and provide a different service to your client. So at the end of the day, the total amount of products that I ended up making was 500 different products. That includes the bases that you guys saw me make and also these trays right here with the patterns. The way that it is working right now is the shipping and all that stuff. It's based off of her schedule and the amount of products she needs at one time, which worked out in the end because I can batch out a whole bunch of their products and then work on another commission projects in between uh, based off of their scheduling. Well, as you guys can see, I have a lot of sailing to do. So let's go inside. I'll show you the other products and we'll end the video. So that's pretty much my experience with this large order here. I kind of just want to share my thoughts and my experience about the process and hopefully you guys can learn something from it. So if you did find this informative, definitely hit that like button, definitely subscribe and leave a comment down below. Let me know your thoughts. Have you ever done large orders like this? How did you handle it? I'd love to hear some of your experience in the comments down below. Until next time guys, this is in Bauer Design Craft Workshop. See ya.